after he was born, the father was very sinful, and the environment in which he was placed was uh, 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 not very conducive to uh, spiritual advancements. But because of the samskar, because of the impressions that were made in his mind and heart, he was uh, he continued to be uh, firmly anchored in the spiritual conception. So this is of course not to say that that's the only time that we can take to spiritual advancements. The point that is made is that it's never too early. Sometimes people say that we'll wait until something happens. We'll wait until we are older, we we'll wait until we are retired, we wait until we take care of all our, all our, uh, all our material duties and then we'll take to spiritual advancements. But uh, uh, one thing that we know that does not follow our schedule is death. Death can come at any time. So there is a pastime in Mahabharat where uh, Maharaj Yudhishthir was once uh, very busy in, in taking care of the duties of his kingdom and a beggar came to him begging for money. And the Maharaj Yudhishthir says, you come tomorrow. I'm, I'm very busy today. I'll give you the charity, whatever you need tomorrow. So when his brother Bhim heard about it, he immediately went to the center of the town hall and he started ringing the bell. And the bell was meant, was meant for when, when uh, something extraordinary happens. So by the sound of the bell, everybody came running, including my Rajadishthir. And they asked Bhim that what happened. And uh, he said, I just found out that my elder brother Yudhishthir is immortal. So Maharaj Yudhishthir said, what are you saying? I'm not immortal. Like everybody, I will die. And he said, but I just heard you say to that person that you come tomorrow. That means uh, you are certain that you will live tomorrow. And if you know that if you live tomorrow, and if you live tomorrow's tomorrow, that means you're deathless. And the Maharaj Yudhishthir understood the understood the message that he was that, that, that he was that he was giving. So many times we have the conception in our in, in our mind, not today but tomorrow. So we all know inevitably everybody dies, but not today. Maybe tomorrow, maybe day after, maybe a day someday in the future, but but uh, but not today. And then Prahlad Maharaj makes this point that all the things in life that uh, are unpredictable. So there are so many things in life that are unpredictable, right? Uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest thing in life that is unpredictable is happiness. We spend our life in the quest for happiness and then what we get is something different. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it does not. Sometimes what we get is the opposite of what we are aspiring for. The people, they, they, they follow a certain path expecting some happiness or some satisfaction at the end of it. And then the path reveals something exactly opposite. So there are so many things that are unpredictable in life. Happiness is one of them. What is, what, what is another thing in life that is completely unpredictable? They say that relationships relationships are completely unpredictable. If we were able to have all the relationships in life the way we wanted to, then life would be perfect. If my boss was behaving to me exactly the way I wanted him to, if my son was behaving with me exactly the, the, the way I, I want him, my colleagues, my friends, then life would be perfect. Right? So we have, the, we have this conception in our mind. You know, if only that, if only they, they acted as per expected. The problem is that everybody has the same conception. So you, even when, when uh, they're looking at us, they're looking at the, with the same expectation. That if only, if, if only as expected. And that's what creates a lot of angst in, in, in relationships. So the first instruction that Prahlad Maharaj gives is that now is the time to take to Sri Don't wait. 
it doesn't matter when if you're young or you're old and um, in one of the in one of the discourses that he has with his friends in the Gurukul he actually does the mathematical calculation where he says that let's assume we live for a hundred years out of a hundred years 30 years you will be sleeping so remaining is 70 years out of that he says the first 15 20 years you're a child so as a child you're too busy learning learning how to survive having fun after that you become a householder as a householder then your duty is to take care of your children to support the society to to be a to be a member of the uh, member of the social order and then after that when your family is settled when your children are settled at that time your senses are weak your vitality has been has been sapped and then just like if there is a if there is a cart that is rolling down a slope it takes a lot of strength to change the course so later on it becomes more and more difficult to change the momentum out of own life so then if you want to go ahead and change your conception of life it's already too late there so that's why he advises that the right time is the right time is is is, is now then he talks about what is the most potent way to make spiritual advancements and then he brings forth the aspect of association that just by good association people become good and by bad association people become bad by spiritual association one can take to the process of spirituality and uh, in in uh, in, in the conversations of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's incarnation of Krishna, he makes he, he 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 calls this as the single most potent aspect of spirituality is to seek spiritual association. Because essentially we become what we associate with. We seek association based on a conception and then we also absorb the association that we that we get. Prabhupada would say that uh, uh, a thief will become an expert thief by associating with other thieves. So when he hang out with other thieves, he'll ask them that, do you know how to open this new model of lock? <laughs> and then he will, he will, he will learn that. And he will say, which, which parts of the city are safe to burglarize at what points of time? So in this way, he will develop more and more knowledge and he will and, and he will become better and better at it. So in the same way, when we when we seek spiritual association, then in the association with our father devotees, we we exchange both our concerns as well as our realizations. That uh, part of the association is that uh, looks like it's a good thing, but not working for me. I have these challenges. And the other person says, yes, even I had those challenges, but this is what helped me. So uh, both by sharing concerns and also by, 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 uh, taking, by taking shelter of other person's realization, one makes progress. Uh, Rupa Goswami in uh, Nectar of Instruction he, he, um, um, he actually calls the six aspects of association. Dadati pratikimati, guhyama khyati prachati, bhangti bhajate chayava, shadbir bhakti pradeshati. That dadati pratikimati, guhyama khyati prachati. That by taking, uh, uh, by accepting it. The first one is, yeah, so, bong, so I was going to speak on Guhya Makhiti Prachiti. So Guhya Makhiti Prachiti means by revealing your mind and confidence and by accepting the other person's confidential exchanges. So these two are the anchor of association. 
So a lot of time we do associate, as we go through life, association is inevitable. But a lot of it is superficial uh, uh, association. So when I uh, when I initially come to America, I wasn't aware of this phrase, uh, how are you doing? And so my person would say, how are you doing? I would stop and say that, you know, I would go ahead and try to explain to him how am I doing? That, you know, <laughs> this is what happened in the morning and I came. And then, then I noticed that those people, they weren't really expecting me to, you know, it's it's just it's just a way of saying hello. That, you know, you say, how are you doing? Other person says, how are you doing? And then, and then it, then it, you know, that's it. So, so that's, so those are, those are more superficial uh, social uh, interactions. The interaction between devotees goes deeper. Then how actually are you doing? Uh, what is working? What is not working? How can I help? How can I be, be, uh, be helped? So, so the form of association is very potent because it supports the practicing aspect of spirituality. So we may theoretically, we may theoretically absorb various aspects of spirituality. We may notionally accept the presence of God. We may also accept the importance of uh, making advancements. But the rubber hits the road when we actually try and put all this into practice. How does a life change? How does a conception to the various events that are happening in life change? How do we deal with happiness and distress? How do we deal with anger and envy? So all that becomes based out of a spiritual conception. Because there are only two conceptions in life, material or spiritual. If you are not operating under the spiritual conception, we are operating under the material conception. What is the essential difference between a material and spiritual conception? In the spiritual conception, we accept the fact that there is God, Krishna is God, and our position is to serve Him. In the material conception, what is, uh, what is, what is the concept that we are anchored in? That we are God. And everybody's purpose in life is to serve us. We may not explicitly say it, but that is our that is our conception. When we walk on the when we when we drive on the road, we expect all the traffic lights to be green for us. We expect everybody to be making way for us. When we come back to our houses, we expect everything to be in order the way that we at work, we expect everybody to behave the way that we would like them to behave. So we, so we want to be the supreme controller and enjoyer. So those are the two conceptions. Either Krishna is God or we are God. And that is the basis on which we operate. If you are angry, then where is that anger coming from? Is that anger coming from the fact that I am the personality of Godhead and this person has actually there to disobey my orders or to blaspheme me or to do something that is not respectful of me? Or if the anger is coming from a spiritual conception that how can I make more advancements? How can I protect Krishna's devotees? How can I protect my own spirituality. So we see in the battle of Kurukshetra, Arjun, the Prabhupada said Arjun used his anger in the service of Krishna because he used his anger to to uh, address the the those who were averse to devotees. So that is that is one way of using anger. Similarly, the other things we have lust and greed and envy and illusion. So, so all this could either be operated from a material conception or a, or, a, or a spiritual conception. So that's the first decision we need to make. We may not be able to operate completely on that, but at least we have to make the decision that I'll aspire to operate on a spiritual conception. And then 
just like when there's a there's a big oil tanker that's going down uh, the, the river it takes a while to steer it but it does it eventually does steer just because they're so large and they're they're such such a large momentum it takes a while so so our entire life we have been operating with a certain conception and not just this life so many lifetimes so it takes time but it does happen inevitably and inexorably it will it will happen um so i've been speaking for about 15 minutes i'll take a break and see if there's any comments is that uh, that uh, uh, the notion of illusion is generally applied to the material conception that you are in an illusion in terms of your of your identity right so in the scripture it is said that there are two kinds of illusion mahamaya and yoga maya so there is one kind of illusion that makes us go away from krishna there is another kind of illusion that makes us go towards krishna so when you see some of the more uh, more esoteric past tense of krishna so there is a shodha mai who is thinking she is krishna's mother trying to beat him with a stick right if she was aware of the fact that he is god she would be giving him obey senses glorifying him she won't be beating him with a stick right so, but that is the so that is a different kind of illusion that actually makes one more uh, uh, more attracted towards towards uh, towards Krishna, and Krishna reserves that for his special devotees. Right? We are mostly under the different kind of illusion, where we are, you know, we are trying to take Krishna's position. That's that's the kind of the Mahamaya kind of uh, kind of illusion. Um, but yes, even we can experience, we can we can also experience Yoga Maya. We can also experience. Uh, when, uh, um, uh, when 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 there are when there are festivals, when there are ecstatic kirtan that's that's uh, that's going on, um, we we just get a sense of being very very connected to Krishna. You know, it's a, it's an out of body experience, and that's the reflection of the of the yoga maya potency. Is that okay? Yeah, it would be. It would yeah. be because. Uh, well, we've seen miracles have happened, you know, and yeah. things have come from nowhere, and something worked out, and we think it's Krishna. It it would be because uh, because as as we make spiritual progress, a lot of our realizations are recorded in our subtle body, and the subtle body carries it over from life to life to life, and uh, you know that's why. Uh, we were discussing in one of the discussions that uh, you know, some people um, they'll they'll just hear a little bit of kirtan and that's it. You know, their whole life changes. There are some people who see a one glimpse of the deity and the and the life will change. Some people will just hear some some uh, uh, scriptural uh, recitation and the life will and the life will change. Um, that's because it's all been recorded in there in the subtle body. There's a small trigger that comes that uh, 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 that happens. Prabhupada would say that uh, for devotees, uh, dreams are a form of realizations. <coughs> now we didn't want people to go overboard. You know, people would initially people would his disciples would come. Prabhupada had this dream, I had that dream. Can you analyze it for me? So he didn't want to go overboard into that. But uh, um, Philosophically, he would make this point that for devotees, uh, dreams are dreams are forms of the realizations, both ways. Sometimes we have fearful dreams. Sometimes we have dreams of associating with devotees, associating with Krishna. So both ways, they're, they're reflections of our realizations. Yeah. Prakshitu. So, Prabhuji, what are some 
practical ways to avoid bewilderment and maintain equanimity. When you were talking about the utility, it reminded me of the path plus pressures, the path here, that was that the happiness and stress are like seasons. You have to not be bewildered by those things. So what are some practical ways to to practice So, so practical ways. Um, so a lot of it is very similar to what we. Uh, so when when we go about um, uh, trying to acquire a new skill, so the first thing we do is we try and understand it, right? So um, uh, the philosophical conviction. So that is that is step one. That uh, understanding understanding what is what and uh, developing philosophical conviction again it's a process and it is available through the study of the scriptures through listening listening of discourses so at least that gives us a it gives us a mental compass that this is the this is the uh, lay of the of the land then based on that philosophical conviction we start practicing and uh, practice is important because practice is what brings philosophy into realizations so philosophically we may we may make a lot of uh, advancements study a lot of study a lot of scriptures a lot of books um, some of the some of the dialogues that I attend there uh, there are people who are very very expert in uh, there's, uh, I remember one of the discussions, there was this professor from Harvard who's been studying the Bhagavad Gita for 30 years. So um, he knows the Bhagavad Gita a lot better than most of the devotees do. He, he understands, he, you know, he obviously knows all the verses, he knows all the different commentaries on the verses, but, but he's an academician. That's, that's his main thing. He does not bring it down to practice. So we were having this, it was an interesting uh, back and forth that uh, you know, he was talking to, to, to devotees who perhaps did not have the same depth of philosophical understanding but a greater level of practice. And uh, uh, he was himself commenting on it, that I can see that uh, you have a much deeper understanding of the essence of, of the Gita because you're actually practicing it. And of course he cannot practice, or at least that's what he said, because he's a professor of religion. So he studies all kinds of religion. And as part of his, uh, his main study is Vaishnavism, but he studies all kinds of religion. Also he's not inclined there. But at least, uh, at least he, was, uh, he was able to discern this difference. That this is the difference between between study and and, uh, and and practice, so 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 those two things, developing some kind of a, some kind of a philosophical understanding, and then aspiring to put it into practice, and that's where the association, the sadhana bhakti, those aspects of of uh, spiritual advancements come in. Is it okay? So, so it probably is Kabir saying that you don't need to read any, do anything, just read, <laughs> understand Prem and that's all. Is that the meaning of the? I didn't fully follow it actually. Yeah, yeah. somebody else may. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't understand the word is the Prem means. Why is nothing else is important? <laughs> you don't have to read any scriptures. Just read the love. I mean, it's a good message. Everybody, you know, 
obviously mm. you know, but is that is, is that enough mm. maybe you're talking more about uh, about the importance of love over uh, just uh, intellectualism So I think in this context, he's looking at love as so studying as theory and love as practice. practice. So you can study, but when you put it in practice, then only it becomes relevant. Um, okay, so uh, so the other points were uh, the Anga Bhakti. Lal Maharaj practiced uh, Smaran, Remembrance. And uh, last, uh, last week we had a discussion on uh, preaching. That how Lal Maharaj exemplified the mood of a preacher. Uh, when to preach, how to preach, who to preach with. And uh, uh, with those who, were, uh, those who were innocent, he was, he was actively preaching. Those who were envious, he was he was quiet, and uh, um, in a way, he was either he was always preaching either by words or by example. So um, to his friends, he would tell them that this is what you need to do. But to those who were uh, not favorable, he was preaching by example. That when his father tried to kill him, he did not get agitated. He was like. If, that's, if that is what is meant to happen, so be it. In the, the whole aspect of surrender. Uh, there. So the last four points, which uh, we'll try and finish today, is uh, uh, <clears throat> so so far we were talking about uh, about uh, Lal Maharaj. So the last four points are more with respect to Krishna. Then what do we understand from from this this past time about how does Krishna deal with his devotees? So we know Prahlad Maharaj, he was a fixed up devotee, he was convinced about the need to serve Krishna. So the first point that comes forth is that uh, we see when Hiranakashipu he tried to kill Prahlad Maharaj, then uh, Krishna comes personally to save him. And um, uh, Krishna could have done anything. He could have he could have sent somebody, he could have killed Hirnakashipu just by some kalp, just by thinking about it. But no, he comes personally to to save him. So that is Krishna's mood towards his devotee. That he is personally vested in their welfare. He does not delegate. Krishna is Krishna is a very good delegator. Everything else he delegates. The whole process of creation of the universe, he delegates to Lord Narayan, and Lord Narayan delegates it to Brahmaji. The whole process of maintenance he delegates to Lord Vishnu. The whole process of destruction he delegates it to Lord Shiva. Shiva. So he's, he's delegating, he's, he's delegating everything. He's busy in Vrindavan herding cows, having, trans, having fun with the, with, the, with the gopis, because he's the personality of Godhead. You know, if he does not want to work, he will find somebody else to do the work for him. But in this situation, he does not delegate. He personally comes. So, so that is the potency of that it pulls Krishna personally in one's life. When Lord Brahma prays to him, he, he says that uh, Krishna, he is, uh, his, his, uh, his lotus feet, the yogis meditate on it for millions of years. And then they get a glimpse of the tips of his lotus feet. So Krishna is so difficult to, difficult to, 
But then right after that, Lord Brahma says, Premanjana Churati Bhakti Vilochanema Santasa Deva Hideishu Vilopiyanti Yamashama Sundaram Achintaya Gunasvarupa Govindamadi Purusham Tamam Vajam And he says, Premanjana Churati Anjan is uh, Kajal, the Premanjana Churati that one's, when then smears one's eyes with the ointment of love, then Krishna immediately appears in front of him. So that is the potency of bhakti. That one who controls everything gets controlled by bhakti. So we see in Vrindavan and, uh, and great, great sages, they are, they are amazed at it. That uh, uh, Krishna, who is the personality of Godhead, who is, who is Ishavasyam Idam Sarvam, who owns everything, and for a palm full of yogurt, he is dancing in front of the gopis. The gopis say, if you want some yoga, show us some dance. And then Krishna dances, and the gopis say, not a good dance, dance again. <laughs> and then he dances again, and they gave him a little bit of yogurt. And when great sages that look at the pastime, they are they are filled with wonder. The one who owns everything in the universe, for for one palm full of yogurt, he is dancing over and over again. His forehead, there is perspiration coming on his on his forehead. He is working so hard. That is his reciprocation to his devotees. Um, one of the things that also happens in the in, in the past time of Prahlad Maharaj is when uh, Lord Narsinghadev kills Hiranakashipu then after he has killed him we see that he is very angry in fact he is so angry that everybody is scared of him even Lord Brahma is scared to, to approach him even Lakshmi Devi his wife is scared to approach him so why do you think he is angry? So that's the reason he is angry. So, so Krishna is beyond the modes. So anger is a mode of is a mode of ignorance. So obviously Krishna cannot be in the mode of ignorance. But he is using anger to make a point. So he is angry at the demigods, the devas. How could you how could you have let this happen? How could you have let my devotee go through so many trials and Tribulations. He's not angry because he had a fight with uh, Hiranakashipu. It was a hard-fought fight, and then finally he won. And so he was his his mode of mood of anger continued. That's not why he was angry about. He was angry about that that um, I do not tolerate offenses against my devotees. That's why Lord Brahma was scared. Lord Brahma was not scared that I gave all these benedictions to. Uh, to Hiranakashipu, so I'm in big trouble. He was in big trouble. He was chastised about it. But that was not what he was scared about. That's not what the devas were scared about. They were scared because they were aware of the offense that they had committed. So Krishna's expectation was from them was that even if it cost you your life, you should have protected my community. So even though Hiranakashipu was much more powerful than all of you, that he had evicted all of you from your respective kingdoms, but nevertheless, you should have protected him, and then I would have protected him. But because you did not, that is an action that that Lord Narasimha Dev is is, uh, is is angry about. Uh, the next point we uh, we see, and this is a this is a little bit of an intricate past, and that when when uh, the Lord Narsingha Dev was angry and then everybody was trying to pacify him then the Devas they approached Lakshmi Devi and they say that you go, you are his wife so so uh, wife generally has uh, more access to the to the husband so you are the wife you go and pacify him and Lakshmi Devi says no way I'm not going there <laughs> I've never seen him so angry. And Devas, they keep coaxing her, and then she says, no. And finally, Lord Brahma, 
tells Prahlad Maharaj, you go, you pacify. And then Prahlad Maharaj goes and then he recites those wonderful prayers. So why do you think that Lakshmi Devi said no and Prahlad Maharaj said yes? Because uh, Lakshmi Devi being his wife, when the husband is extremely angry, they will generally accept whatever he says and they will they will not try to interfere that moment. Mm. Yeah. But she could have pacified him, right? She could have accepted it but pacified him. But it, 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 you know, I was kind of uh, uh, feeling that, you know, it may it was not towards uh, Prahlad Maharaj, like uh, uh, he has a genuine feeling, he felt very bad that how can on a small boy so much atrocities can happen. Mm. That sympathetic view at that time, Narasimha Dev is carrying for Prahlad Maharaj, so it is more easy for Prahlad Maharaj. That's why he could go. But for us, Lakshmi Devi, like, she tries to pass it on to her. I don't know if she can have so much of Lakshmi. She can work for it. It's also a lesson, right? That when devotees approach God, it's, it's with this whole amount of humility that they're approaching God. Mm. So that is the one lesson part of it that why Prahlad Maharaj was able to pacify. Have you heard this lecture earlier? <laughs> <laughs> She's getting all the answers right on the head. <laughs> Especially after you, you're coming after a month, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should take more breaks. I think you come with more realizations. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you said two things. Go ahead. Hold on a second. And the, and the second one, I, this is just speculation, but you know, Hirani Kashyapu had been blessed because of his tapasya by the other demigods, right? Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, huh? Brahma. Bra Bra Brahma. So, obviously, for Brahma to go and pacify at that point is like he has given that boon. So, that is why Brahma wouldn't be. Happy about approaching. No, no this is about Lakshmi Devi, not Brahma. Okay, mm -hmm. Lakshmi Devi. Okay. No, I wouldn't know that. No. Or if, uh, yeah, That's I don't have a but, but the first point is true. So, um, so, so what Ravi Prabhu is saying was also accurate that, uh, um, and of course, we are dealing with exalted personalities, so we are not judging them. But if Lakshmi Devi went to, to Lord Narsingha Dev, and, uh, and and he, he chastised her. Lakshmi Devi went to Narsingha Dev and says, please don't be angry. And Narsingha Dev says, you go away from here. Right? So Lakshmi Devi is thinking that if he does that, I'll be insulted. Pran Maharaj, he has no ego. He's like, fine. If he chastises me, fine. If he doesn't, that's, that's, that's good also. So he went with a sense of complete humility. That whatever the Lord does is okay. That I go to him and I and I and I say that please be pacified and then he he slaps me, that is fine also. Or if he pats me, that is fine also. Now again we are here dealing with two pure devotees. Lakshmi Devi herself is a is a is a, is a pure devotee. So not to say that she has ego, she cannot. She's, you know, she's she's the personality. But uh, um, I try to say that these pastimes happen to demonstrate a to demonstrate a, a point. Um, so so that is the approach that pleases Krishna. One of complete humility. And whatever you do, sometimes people go to God and say that, give me this, give me this, give me this. When you know they ask for five things. Krishna gives three things and then he says, why didn't you give me two things? And they get upset. And they say, I do this, I do that. And you know, still still did not happen. I, I, uh, I worship your deity every day. I give in charity. I'm a good person. So, so there is this exchange of expectation. Later on, uh, uh, Lord Narsingha Dev, he asked Prahlad Maharaj, that you, you ask for any benediction. And Prahlad Maharaj says that, uh, how can I ask for a benediction from you? 
because everything that I want and aspire for is already taken care. And it's not my it's not in it's not my position to ask you for anything. My position is to ask you for only one thing, and that is how can I serve you. So that is the so so, so that is the mood. The other point that is made, which is uh, I, I think it's a, it's a little bit more. Uh, uh, I don't know how shastric it is, but I heard about it that uh, sometimes we try to pacify God with money. So we go we go to the temple, and then we put ten dollars over there and say, you know, please ten percent raise this time. Like this. <laughs> so I would say that you know. That doesn't sound from, if you look at it from Krishna's perspective, right? He's giving you a lot more than you're giving him, so it's not a, it's not a very, uh, very viable transaction. But, uh, but this mood of, uh, of, uh, and Lakshmi Devi, of course, is this, this particular Lakshmi Devi is ritual, but when we use it in, for material uh, purposes, then she becomes material. So this mood of using, of using material opulences to uh, get favors from the Lord, so it kind of reflects on that, it doesn't work. The best way to get Krishna's favor, Krishna's attention, is to surrender to him in a mood of humility. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next point is... Uh, uh, yes, Madhuri. So, so the next point is, how do devotees see Krishna? So, if you look at this particular pastime, there is, there is uh, Lord Narsingha Dev sitting on the throne and you, you must have seen pictures right he has he has blood all over him he has the he has the guts and intestines of Hirnakashapu around his shoulders his nails are dripping with with with, uh, with blood his eyes are are red with anger and what is the Maharaj seeing he is seeing his most adorable most attractive, most worshipable deity. So that's the mood of devotees. In all forms, Krishna is attractive. Whether Krishna comes to me, comes to us in terms of life, or he comes to us in terms of death. Whether he comes to us in terms of happiness, or he comes to us in terms of distress. Whether he comes as peace or he comes as anxiety. In all forms, Krishna is attractive. And when Prahlad Maharaj approached Narsingha Dev like that, Lord Narsingha Dev, what does he do? He puts his hand on his head. So, so Krishna's hand on the head of a devotee is Abhayda, that fearlessness. May you be fearless in all circumstances. So that is Krishna's reciprocation. And, uh, and, 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 the, and the last point, it goes back to the, the past time, that uh, when, when Lord Narasimha Dev insisted that Prahlad Maharaj asked for a benediction, earlier on he says, no, I don't want one. He actually gets upset. And he says, you know, why are you trying to bewilder me? Why are you trying to cheat me? I'm so weak as it is. Of course he is not, but he's out of humility he's saying, I'm so weak as it is. You're offering me these material trappings and it's easy for me to get, get uh, uh, deviated. So let my mind just focus on you. And Lord Narasimha Dev says, no, you asked for some benediction. So what did, what did Plan Maharaj ask for? Service. 
to the Lord. Yeah. How can I serve you? Uh, he, he asked that his father be forgiven. So the person who was the cause of all this distress, all this suffering, he says that if it, if it pleases you, please forgive my father. And uh, Narsingadev says, even before you asked for it, not only is he forget, forgiven, ten generations that appear before you and ten generations that will appear after you have my shelter there. So that is the potency of taking to devotional service. So uh, it's not that uh, sometimes when people take to bhakti, then uh, the family members say that you're being selfish. All you're looking for is your own spiritual emancipation. You have duty to your parents, you have duty towards 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 your uh, towards your offsprings, and, and there the duties are there. But the ultimate benefit that you can give them is by becoming a devotee yourself. When you become a devotee, then they get the opportunity to make spiritual advancements. That is Krishna's promise. Not just over here, here he demonstrates it, but in many other places. He makes this promise that one who takes one who takes to my takes takes to bhakti, then the forefathers of the person and the descendants of the person automatically come in my shelter. So, so these are the these are these are the ten points uh, that uh, we set out to discuss and. Uh, Thanking you for your cooperation. We did achieve it. I'll just pause here and see if there's any. Uh, yes, Malika. What is your, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so, being killed by uh, by Krishna is it also a form of mercy? Because it reminds me of. I mean, not to compare, but it reminds me of Vishnu uh, Pradama. Uh, on how he wanted Krishna to kill him, so he made him pick up his weapon you know, in the war. So, because he wanted mukti from Krishna, I mean, he wanted mukti from his current life from Krishna. So, death by Krishna itself should be a form of mukti. Isn't it? It is a, it's a slippery slope that uh, we would rather, we would rather have uh, Krishna's uh, Krishna's affection than Krishna's hatred. So um, there's some truth that uh, you know uh, those who are killed by Krishna attain some kind of liberation. It's called sayuchi, impersonal liberation. So while it is liberation, it is the most painful form of liberation because. You go into the impersonal Brahman, there is just nothingness over there. The souls by nature, they are active, they are satchitanand, they are sentient, they want relationships, and there is nothing over there. All your senses have been have been depleted. So yes, it's a form of liberation, but it is the most painful form of liberation. So devotees don't aspire to that. And also, if you aspire to be killed by Krishna, Krishna will probably send somebody else to kill you. <laughs> and so you don't even get that benefit. Right? So what we aspire for is Krishna's mercy. So the example that you're giving of Bhishma Dev is actually it's a little different from what it plays out in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhishma did not want Krishna to kill him. He did not want Krishna to kill him, and Bhishma is ready to give up his life. All that he asked for is that the lotus feet of Krishna be in front of him. That's all he asked for. And Bhishma Devi, you're right, he's a great devotee, and he had that mood, he had that, uh, he, uh, he had that, uh, that, uh, uh, ras, that mood of chivalry. He was a great warrior, he appreciated Krishna as a warrior. He thinks about Krishna in that, 
in, in, in that form. But he's a devotee. He never aspires for Hare Krishna to, uh, uh, to kill him. Um, it's a different matter that he wanted to kill Arjun. And that's where Krishna came and interfered. But it was not so that Krishna kills him. He had promised Duryodhan that I'll kill Arjun. So that's what he was trying to do. He had to take Krishna. two more births. Really? Because uh, Hiranyakashipu is, if you look at the pastime in the Bhagavatam, Hiranakshan and Hiranyakashipu are, uh, are uh, doorkeepers. Jai right, right, right. right? Jai Vijay. So they were cursed to take three births as demons. So then next time they took birth as Ravan and Kumkaran. And next time they took birth as Shishupal and Tantvakra. After that they also had their comeuppance, right? They had to pay for their karmas, in other words. So what kind of forgiveness did Hiranyakashipu get because Prahlad Maharaj asked for it? So two different questions. Uh, Hiranyakashipu did not have any karma because he was cursed. He was from the spiritual world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No karma over it. Mm -hmm. Right? He couldn't have. He was cursed at a deeper level he was serving Krishna because Krishna has this media bhav. He wants to fight, mm -hmm. but there's nobody in the spiritual world who will fight with Krishna. Everybody is Jai Krishna, Jai Krishna. So when he says that in the material world, there's nobody who's qualified to give you a good fight. So as a service to Krishna, he comes and he becomes a demon and then he fights. That's 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 the that's a deeper understanding. The uh, the other part of the question that you were saying is that uh, uh, what is the what happens to karma when somebody takes to takes the shelter of Krishna? Right. And Krishna says that I burn away your karma. So so karma is material, and Krishna can do anything that he wants uh, wants with it. So that's why when devotees take to take to Krishna consciousness, then. Uh, their life no longer is is dictated by the laws of karma. They may still suffer, they obviously still grow old, they still die. But uh, uh, so, so the understanding is that uh, it, it, it is not driven by your past karma, it is driven by Krishna's attempt to purify you. When devotees fall sick, their mind goes to how can I take more shelter of Krishna? So it's a form of purification. When, devote, when something good happens in the life of a devotee, their mind goes that I'm so fortunate that Krishna is looking at me. So externally it may look the same, but ultimately it is uh, Krishna trying to help the devotee make spiritual effort. So that's why it, it looks like karma, but it's not really karma. Yeah? Is it true that uh, Jai Vijay were given option? That you can be uh, born as my enemy three times, or born as my devotee, but five times. Yes. yes. Yeah. So it's not in the Bhagavatam, but it's in the Narsim Puran that they were given this option. And uh, the reason they took they, they, they took option one is because of this that uh, they understood the inner mood of Krishna. The Krishna enjoys he, he has his media rust. He also enjoys fighting. He enjoys he enjoys valor. He enjoys chivalry. And then they wanted to serve Krishna. In that. And the second reason was that they said that. Um, um, I would rather live in the body of a demon if I can come back quickly to you. So rather than having four lives as devotees, better for me to have three lives as demons so that I can quickly resume my service.
Anything else? Prabhuji, you gave an example of spirituality and materialistic. That was very good definition, you know. But I also think, look, this way, those people who are running after material thing, they are materialistic, and those who are running after God, the material is running after them, you know. That's yeah. true. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good point uh, that uh, the, the whole material world is controlled by Durga Devi. And Durga Devi is, uh, uh, she is a great devotee of Krishna. So when she sees that others are, are, are uh, when she, somebody is taking to the lotus feet of Krishna, then she becomes affectionate. And Acharyas also say, and they quote Lakshmi Devi. So Lakshmi Devi, she says that, uh, um, that I am a woman, so by nature I am sikku. I am here today, gone tomorrow. But regardless of how fickle I am, I will always be there where my husband is. So people who aspire for Lakshmi Devi on herself, so she may come and the person might become opulent and then she goes and the person loses the opulence. But where Krishna is, she will be there. Where her husband is, she will be there. So, um, so devotees of Krishna, it's not that they are materially impoverished. Mm. It's just that material opulence is not a high priority. High priority. Mm. Uh, uh, the way Jay Vijay came to the material world and the way we came to material world, like we made a bigger offense because in their case also there was a slighter offense of stopping Lakshmi Devi. So, but are we a bigger offender? So different, uh, 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 so Jay Vijay came as a pastime, right, they came as a pastime to help, help Krishna, they were Parishads, so they were Krishna's eternal associates, yeah. we are not Parishads, we are Jivas, yeah. so, so the difference is, Parishad is right? so Parishad is eternal associates, their position, their position, their, their position does not change. Nitya Mukta, that Nitya Muktas? Nitya Muktas? So they are kind of Nitya. They are they're kind of Nitya Muktas. But Parishas are different. Her category. So, so they came, the four Kumaras cursed them, they came as a service to service to Krishna. The whole pastime was, was, was conducted. Um, we also came for an offense, but a different offense. So uh, Jay Vijay did not offend Krishna. They offended the four Kumars, which Krishna said is as good as an offense to me, but they offended him. Jay Vijay did not have any aspirations of taking Krishna's position. Right? We had that aspiration. That's the root offense. Sure. That the jivas, at some point, they look at Krishna and then they say that, that uh, he is the only one who is the center of attention. I want to be the center of attention. He is the only one who is? Who is? the focus of everybody's devotion. I want to be the focus of everybody's devotion. And then Krishna says that in the spiritual world there can be only one, but in the material world there are many people like you. So so that's that the root offense that we have is, is Krishna Dvesh. That we develop envy towards Krishna. So I, I don't think Krishna will come personally to kill us. <laughs> but uh, but he, will, he has sent his devotees to rescue us. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we should get the children for the... I think it is, uh,